good morning everybody at the outset i congratulate the bar council of maharashtra and goa for organizing this lecture series this lecture series would help the persons appearing for the selection process for the post of the president district consumer commission and the post of the members of the state commission and district consumer commission bar council of maharashtra and goa is taking up these ventures continuously such as clep that is a continuous legal education program it is an it is with the award object the bar council of maharashtra and goa is functioning all credits to them friends as a member and the president of the district consumer commission and the state commission you are required to deal with varied laws such as the competition act the sale of goods act the drugs and cosmetics act and many such laws you will have to be well equipped with all these laws this lecture series will help you in preparing well the subject given to me for this inaugural lecture is general principles of contract concerning the consumer protection act the contract act is the mother of all laws concerning contracts the sale of goods act the partnership act the transfer of property act for all the purposes of contract you have to rely upon the general principles of contract as enunciated under the indian contract act 1872 i would not go through each and every provision of the same i would only cursorily go through the provisions which you would be required to consider while dealing with the cases before the com consumer commissions as you all know there are not all agreements are contracts only those agreements enforceable by law are contracts section 10 of the contract act prescribes that all agreements or contracts which are entered into with the free consent of the parties competent to contract for a lawful object and a lawful consideration and which are not hereby expressly declared to be void the second para to section 10 also lays down that nothing herein will apply to those laws which require the compulsory registration of document or the attestation of witnesses or they are required to be in writing now what these concepts depict all agreements are contracts which are entered into with the free consent of the parties competent to contract the parties to the contract should be competent to enter into the contract when a matter comes to you about a breach of contract we'll have to see whether the parties to the contract are competent to enter into the contract section 11 and 12 of the contract act deals with those parties who are competent to contract section 11 says that all parties are competent to contract for of the age of majority according to the law to which they are subject and which are not hereby expressly excluded from contracting the age of majority would differ from law to law those contracts which are governed by personal law the age of majority would be as per the personal law where the contracts are entered into with a guard with a minor who was under the guardianship of guardian at litem during his minority then in that case the age of majority rises to 21 years otherwise as per the indian majority act the age of majority is 18 years section 11 also prescribes that a person to be competent to enter into the contract should be of a sound mind what is a sound mind is defined in section 12 a person is said to be of a sound mind if at the time of entering the contract he is in a position to arrive at a rational judgment as to the contract and the about the interest to be affected in the contract so these are the persons who are competent to contract and those persons should not be expressly disqualified from contracting 
who are the persons who are expressly disqualified from entering the contract, those are also provided. For example, the felons or the convicts, a person is declared insolvent, he is not permitted to contract, an alien enemy, these are the persons who are expressly prohibited from entering into the contract. So first of all, what you have to see is whether the contract that is said to have been entered into the part between the parties is between the parties who are competent to enter into a contract. A person who is occasionally of a sound mind, but sometimes he is of unsound mind, cannot enter into a contract when he is of unsound mind. For example, schizophrenia. Or a person who is occasionally of an who is normally of an unsound mind but occasionally of a sound mind may enter into contract when he is of a sound mind. The period when the person of a sound mind is known as a lucid interval. So during the lucid, in, lucid interval he can enter into a contract. Then the next concept is free consent. Section 13 defines consent. Both the parties are said to consent when they agree upon the same thing in the same sense. That is, the persons should be ad idem while entering into a contract. Section 14 does not require only a consent. It requires free consent. Even section 10 which we have seen requires that which is entered into between the parties competent to contract with the free consent. So section 14 says that consent is said to be free when it is not caused by coercion as defined under section 15 or undue influence as defined under section 16 or fraud as defined under section 17 or misrepresentation as defined under section 18 and mistakes subject to provisions of section 20, 21 and 22. Now what do we mean by coercion? Coercion means committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by the Indian Penal Code or detaining or threatening to detain any property of any person whatsoever to his prejudice so as to ask him to enter into, so as to induce him to enter into a contract. Now this coercion can be committed at a place where the Indian Penal Code also is not in force. That is the explanation to section 15. This coercion is a physical act. It is not necessary that the act should actually be committed even if a threat is given of commission of an act which is forbidden by the Indian Penal Code, then also the coercion can be said to have been employed. If a person even gives a threat that if you don't enter into contract then I would commit a suicide that would come within the ambit of coercion. Even if a third person, if a threat is given or a third person's property is detained so as to ask a person to enter into a contract then also the coercion can be said to be implied. For example, if a wants B to enter into contract with him or if he wants B to sell his house which is worth 10 lakh for rupees 1 lakh and for that purpose he kidnaps the son of C and says that if you don't enter into the contract he will harm the son of C still it would be said that the coercion is employed because the word used to the prejudice of any person whatever. The next concept is the consent should not be caused by undue influence. A consent is said to be caused by into influence when the relation subsisting between the parties is such that one is in a position to dominate the will of the other and uses that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. Now this undue influence is a mental act. There the relation subsisting with the parties should be such that one is in a position to dominate the will of the other. The generality, this is the general proposition, thus examples are given about that in the provision itself that when one person is in a fiduciary capacity over the other, that person is said to be in a position 
to dominate the will of the other. The examples are the relationship between a doctor and a patient, the advocate and the client, the spiritual leader and the disciple. These are the examples where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of the party is in a position to dominate the will of the other. But the requirement is that he should exercise that position, he should use that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. If a contract is between a doctor and a patient and the contract is fair enough, only because the relation subsists between the parties that would not be sufficient to come to the conclusion that the contract is induced by undue influence. However, if the relations are subsisting and on the face of it, it appears that the contract has been entered into by exercising undue influence, then the court can consider the set aspect and in that case, the burden of proof will be upon the person who is in the dominant position and that would be an exception to section 111 of the Indian Evidence Act. So these are the examples of not a free consent because of coercion, undue influence. The third aspect is fraud. The concept of fraud is more or less raised in many matters. Section 17 defines fraud. Fraud means and includes any of the following acts committed by the party or his agent or with his connivance so as to induce the another party or his agent to enter into the contract. Those are, number one, suggestion as to a fact which is not true by a person who himself does not believe it to be true. Number two, active concealment of a fact not warranted by the information of the person. Number three, any promise made without any intention of performing it. Number four, any other act fitted to deceive. And number five, any such act or omission which the law specially declares it to be fraudulent. Now this number one, suggestion as to a fact which is not true however, by a person who himself does not believe it to be true is known as suggestio falsi. The person intentionally makes a false statement knowing well that he is not making a correct statement. And there is a fine distinction between fraud under section 17 and misrepresentation under section 18. The only distinction is of an intention. In fraud, a deliberate false statement is made, whereas under misrepresentation, under section 18, an innocent wrong statement is made. Fraud may also give rise for a criminal liability, whereas misrepresentation would not. But the effect on the contract would be the same. It would be a voidable contract. The second one is concealment of fact, that is known as suppressio veri wherein a person actively conceals a fact in that case also it's a case of fraud which would induce the other person to enter into the contract any promise made without an intention to perform it now this is a difficult one to adjudge because one will have to show that at the time when the contract was entered into he had an intention of not performing it. Suppose a contract is entered into between A and B for purchase of a machinery worth about one crore. On the, at the date when the contract is entered into, A has a balance of one crore with him. But because of the circumstances, he sustains heavy losses in the business and thereafter is not in a position to honor his contract. Here it cannot be said that he had no intention of performing his promise when it was entered into. So it would not be a case of a fraud. But if a person enters into a contract knowing that he does not have any amount with him and still asks the other person to enter into the contract, then it can be said that he has made a promise without intention of performing it. The fourth one is any such act fitted to deceive. The Contract Act is enacted in 1872. Persons may come out with new methodologies of committing fraud upon the others. So, the legislature took into consideration this aspect and has also said that any such act which would come within the ambitant meaning of deception 
that would be sufficient to bring it within the ambit and purview of fraud. And the last one is any such act or omission which the law specially declares it to be fraudulent. There are some provisions of the statute which declare the act to be fraudulent. Under the Transfer of Property Act, while a person wants to sell an immovable property, he is duty bound to disclose all the defects in the property. If he does not disclose it, if he fails to disclose it, then that omission would amount to a fraud. There is an explanation attached to this section 17, that is, mere silence as to a matter of fact, which would affect the willingness, willingness of a person to enter into the contract is not a fraud unless the circumstances of the case are such that it is the duty of the person keeping silence to speak or silence is equivalent to speech. There is a concept of caveat tempta, let the buyer beware. So a person is not supposed to speak when he is not or when he is not required by law to speak. He, mere silence, if he knows that the market conditions in future would come down, but still he does not say that to other party, then it is not said to be a fraud. Because mere silence, as to a matter of fact, which would affect the willingness of a person to enter the contract is not fraud, unless the relations subsisting between the parties is such that it is the duty of the person keeping silence to speak. There may be some contracts of my fidai, which very a person is required to, to speak about the defects. In that case, if he keeps silence, then it only it would be a fraud. The best example in which every now and then the matters would come before the consumer forums, consumer commissions, would be the contract of insurance. The contract of insurance is a contract you you will my feelings. That is the contract of active confidence, the contract of active trust, wherein a person is bound to divulge all the defects which he has while entering into the contract of insurance. The contract of insurance may be with regard to the person or with regard to the property. That is also one of the example of a contingent contract which you see from section 31 to section 36 of the contract act. So in that case, it is a duty of a person, the relation subsisting parties between the parties is such that it is a duty of the person keeping silence to speak. Even in those cases of personal laws where marriage is a contract, then in that case also it is a duty of the person keeping silence to speak because relations subsisting between the parties is such that it is his duty to speak out. This is about the fraud misrepresentation we have seen that it is a case of an innocent suggestion of a false fact but the consequences is same which is provided in section 19 and 19a of the contract act then the last one is mistake subject to provisions of section 20 21 and 22 section 20 deals with unilateral with the mutual mistake of fact it says that when both the parties are at a mistake as to a matter of fact, the agreement is void. Here the word used is agreement and not contract. So wherever a consent is obtained by the persons who are at a mistake of fact, both the parties are at a mistake of fact, then the agreement is void. The agreement does not take the shape of a contract. The void agreement would mean that no rights and liabilities flow from that agreement. The agreement is a dead agreement. The, it is like a stillborn child. A child is born but born dead. An agreement is there but it's a dead agreement, never taking the shape of a contract. But the condition precedent is that both the parties should be at a mistake as to a matter of fact. For example, A has got three properties at three different places. Say X, Y and Z. A wants to sell his property X to B. B is under impression that A is selling his property Z to him. And in that regard, they enter into an agreement. Here, both the parties are at a mistake as to a matter of fact. And so, applying the principle of ignorantia facit excusat, the agreement would be void ab initio. 
Section 21 deals with agreement entered into between the parties on account of a mistake of law. Section 21 says that if an agreement is entered upon, upon a mistake of fact that would not affect the agreement, it would be a valid contract because of the principle of ignorantia juris non excusat. Ignorance of law is no excuse. Then section 22 is unilateral mistake of fact. If it is case of a unilateral mistake of fact, then in that case also the agreement is a valid contract where one party alone is at a mistake as to a matter of fact. For example, a person goes at an exhibition center, he feels that the particular painting is of a great painter M. F. Hussein and he purchases it at rupees 1 lakh. After coming home, he finds that the painting is of an ordinary painter which would not even be worth 5000 rupees. He goes back. Then in that case, he goes back to the exhibition but the exhibition does not take back that painting and return the amount to him. Here it is a case of a unilateral mistake of fact. He should thank himself for the mistake he has committed. He would not be entitled for the reimbursement because the agreement is a valid contract. So this is with regard to the free consent of the parties. So section 10 that we have seen is all agreements are contracts which are entered into with the free consent of the parties competent to contract and for a lawful object and consideration. Section 23 and 24 of the contract act deals with lawful objects and consideration. Section 23 says that an object or a consideration is lawful unless it is forbidden by law, if permitted or is of such a nature that if permitted it would defeat the provisions of law, which the courts, which according to the courts is immoral or opposed to public policy or it implies injury to the person or property of another. In all these cases, the object or consideration is unlawful. And wherever the object or consideration is unlawful, the agreement is void. Now, the, there are four ingredients in this, wherein the object or consideration is unlawful, now is forbidden by law, which is not permitted by law. If an agreement is entered into for accepting a bribe, gratification is illegal, it is forbidden by law, it is not permitted. So, agreement for this purpose would not be enforceable in the courts of law or is of such a nature that if permitted to defeat the provisions of law, that agreement may not be expressly barred by law, but if permitted, it would defeat the provisions of law. Take for example, a person owns a immoral property, he has not paid corporation taxes for long, there are a huge amount of corporation taxes due upon him. The corporation puts that property for auction. That person is not entitled to bid in the auction. He goes to B and says that you bid for that property at a lower price, purchase it and then give it to me. He enters into an agreement. Now here this person who is the owner of the property is not permitted to bid as per the law. He goes to B for B to bid on his behalf, he enters into an agreement that if in auction B purchases, he will again transfer that property to A. B in auction purchases that property at a very less price. A goes to him and shows that there is an agreement. You may now transfer this property to me. B refuses to transfer it. Now this agreement is such that if permitted, it would defeat the provisions of law. So such an agreement is also not enforceable before you. Or is of such a nature that if involves injury to the person or property of another. Now one of the best example of this is bonded labor. The, any contract, any agreement for bonded labor would be void because bonded labor is not recognized. It Bonded labor implies injury to the person. It affects its freedom. Such an agreement is said to be for unlawful object and consideration. And the fourth one is that the courts regarded as immoral or opposed to public policy. Now here, 
opposed to public policy or immoral is left to the discretion of the court. It says all the courts regarded as immoral or opposed to public policy. The concept of immorality, the concept of opposed to public policy would change with changing circumstances, changing environment and changing times. It is never stagnant. What is immoral in a civilized society in urban area may not be immoral in tribal area. What is immoral in our country may not be immoral in western country. So the concept of immorality would change from time to time. Even the concept of opposed to public policy would change from time to time. The concept of immorality, the concept of opposed to public policy cannot be controlled. It is like an unruly horse. As you cannot control an unruly horse, you cannot control the definition of opposed to public policy and immorality. So that is why it has been left to the discretion of the court to come to the conclusion that whether the particular thing is opposed to public policy or not, or whether it is immoral or not. Now these sections from 25 to 30 are the sections which are opposed to public policy, which deal with the agreement and restraint of marriage, agreement and restraint of trade, agreement and restraint of legal proceedings, uncertain agreements and wagering agreements. These are the agreements which are opposed to public policy and are expressly declared to be void. We need not go into the details of that because of the time constraints. Now another aspect which you will be required to consider when the matter comes regarding the sale of goods or the transfers of properties is section 38 of the contract act. It says that every promiser must perform or offer to perform his promise. Now this offer to perform should include readiness and willingness. Readiness and willingness are not two different are, are two different concepts, they are not one and the same concept. Willingness is intention to perform, whereas readiness is capacity to perform, capability to perform. Just by saying that I am ready to perform, I am ready and willing to perform would not suffice. He would show that at the relevant time he had the capacity, he had the means, he had the capability to perform his part of the promise. If he fails to do so, he commits the breach of contract. So this section 38 also would be required to be considered. Section 39 deals with the anticipated breach of contract. We need not go into the concept of the frustration of contract here right now because those are the cases which would rarely come to the consumer forums. About the time being an essence of contract, this you may have to consider in section 55 of the Contract Act. As far as frustration is concerned, rarely it is only because of the impossibility of the performance or the performance is unlawful, then only it can be said that the contract stands frustrated. The question would be basically which you would be required to consider is of damages. Section 73 and 74 deals with damages. When there is a breach of contract, a party comes before you. The commission is not in a position to direct specific performance then the damages are to be awarded. There are two types of damages, unliquidated and liquidated. Section 74 deals with liquidated damages. Liquidated damages are those damages which are arrived at between the parties at the time of entering into the contract. Take for example, at the time of entering into a contract, the parties arrive at that if one party commits a breach of contract, the other party would pay him rupees 1 lakh. One of the party commits a breach of the contract. The other party files a suit in the court or comes before the National Commission for damages for that. Now, he sustains a loss of only rupees 10,000 actually. But the liquidated damages arrived at with the parties is 1 lakh. Whether the total amount of 1 lakh is to be awarded? The answer would be no. Because the section says that the damages can be awarded not exceeding the amount named so named. 
so the courts have a discretion to award a less amount of compensation not necessarily what has been agreed upon between the parties now take a reverse case that the damages agreed upon is 1 lakh but the loss sustained by one of the party because of the breach on the part of the other party is say 10 lakhs will the court award 10 lakhs the answer would be no because it the section 74 does not give the discretion to the courts to award the damages more than what has been agreed upon the wordings will have to be considered it says that not exceeding the amount so named in the contract so at the most in such a case rupees 1 lakh can be awarded and lesser amount can be awarded if lesser loss has been caused that discretion has been given to the court the only exception is the bonds when the bonds have been executed by the parties then in case in that case the entire amount of bond is to be awarded the bonds may be the bail bond the bonds which are entered into with regard to the security of the service and elsewhere this is regarding the liquidated damages now in many of the matters the damages are not fixed those are known as unliquidated damages in case of unliquidated damages there are various concepts which are required to be considered the damages are divided into general damages special damages nominal damages exemplary damages now general damages are the damages which in a normal course would arise because of the breach committed by the party special damages are that the parties know that if a breach is committed the actual loss that would be sustained by the other party then in that case special damage are damages are required to be awarded now there may be cases that because of breach no loss has been caused to one party though the breach has been committed no loss has been caused caused to a party in that case you award nominal damages that is in recognition of violation of a legal right in recognition of infringement of a legal right these are to be awarded as nominal damages and exemplary damages are awarded in exceptional cases such as wherein because of the breach or because of the act of the other party the loss is caused to the reputation in that case exemplary damages are awarded take for example the dishonor of a check a dishonor of a check a wrongful dishonor of a check would affect the reputation of that person in that case the courts can award exemplary damages there is a factor which is required to be considered the damages are not to be awarded for remote loss or damage that is known as remoteness of damages there may be cases that the loss caused is not the direct result of the breach but is an incidental one then in case of remoteness of damages you need not award that take for example a person is traveling by a bus from a place to b place the conductor of the ticket is say 100 rupees the conductor makes that person alight in the midst only he does not allow him to travel to his destination because of that he has to take another commutation and so he travels by say another bus and he goes where he has to pay about 75 rupees more he would be certainly entitled for that damages but if he he is required to alight and thereafter it starts raining and in rain he suffers he because of the rains he suffers from cold and cough he has to go to the hospital spend 1000 rupees for his treatment then in that case he is not entitled for the damages of 1000 rupees because that is a remote damage that is a remote loss another factor which is required to be considered is mitigating damages what are the steps taken by the person who is complaining about the breach of contract to reduce the damage to reduce the loss if he has the means at his disposal to mitigate the loss to 
reduce the loss, then he has to take steps to reduce the loss. If he fails to take the steps to reduce the loss, then in that case, he will not be entitled to more damages because he failed in his duty to mitigate the loss. This is known as theory of mitigating damages. This is what section 73 lays down. Now these provisions you will have to come across every now and then even while you deal with the matters under the Sales of Goods Act. Sale of Goods Act in, in a way was a part of the Indian Contract Act originally from section 76 to 123. Subsequently the special act was enacted in 1930 that is Sales of Goods Act and these provisions were thereafter incorporated under the Sales of Goods Act wherein all these general principles of contract you have to come across while dealing with matters under the Sale of Goods Act also. For example, the unpaid seller's lien. Under the Sales of Goods Act, there is a concept of unpaid seller's lien. Now, the basic provision of lien is under the Contract Act, under sections 171 to 176, wherein there is a concept of lien. If there is a pledge, there is a hypothecation. These are the securities, a lien of the person creditor is there on that. So if a person has sold the property, he is not paid his dues, he has got unpaid seller's lien. The Sale of Goods Act will further deal with what are the circumstances in which he can exercise this lien, whether he can exercise this lien once he part with the possession of that movable property, this will have to be considered. Now if the contract between the parties is sale of a property with regard to specifications, then the provisions of the contract act say, referring to section 37 and 38, that the person to whom the offer is made to perform should be given a reasonable opportunity of satisfying himself that what is sought to be sold is the same which for which the contract has been arrived at. So these are all interrelated provisions between the Sale of Goods Act, the Contract Act, the Partnership Act, the Transfer of Property Act, the, all these will rely upon the basic principles of contract which are laid down under the provisions of the Contract Act 1872. The Competition Act, the matters which you receive under the Competition Act also, there also you have to see whether it, whether the contract with the parties is such that it is resulting to unhealthy competition, when it does it, you have to revert back to section 23 saying that it is opposed to public policy. Even a contract which is unhealthy, which gives unhealthy rise to the competition would be a contract which would be an agreement opposed to public policy and void under section 23 of the contract act. This is for today. Let us see afterwards. Thank you.